So it's a pleasure to welcome my colleague from the Center of Humanity, long friend, uh, long friend and one of the first organizers of this summer school back in 2007. Uh, Nasu, uh, well, he, for those who don't know, he's one of the first visiting researchers. Just a bit of how they behave according to Newton, okay? 
then you can create a gates out of them. So this is one way a gate would work. You have a ball that will come in here and here. And if the, the two of them come synchronized, of course they hit themselves here, hit the pool table, and hit them again. So they come out here and here. So there will be a ball coming out here, only if and only if the two balls come in here and here at the same time. Okay? So this is an end gate. Okay? Because this output happens only when this and this are happening. The two balls are coming out and coming in together exactly there. So of course this is, a, this is an example of a model that you, that you can study. And actually people study this kind of model because they're interested in the dynamics of this and uh, they can propose different uh, boards with different shapes and study the behaviors uh, that's chaotic or regular and so on. But it's interesting to investigate some things like reversibility. So this was actually the springboard that took people to think about can you do reversible computation? Because uh, Newton's laws are reversible in time. Right? So if by studying a model like this, you get an idea of what you can do in classical mechanics using the theory of classical mechanics. Several automata are, are is another way of doing computation, and there are many others. Okay, so this is all classical. So for quantum computation, uh, there are many different models as well, and I'll be talking about a couple of them here. And they're all presumed to be equivalent. Equivalent in the sense of what you can do with some quantum system, uh, it's presumed that you can do with other quantum systems which have sufficiently rich dynamics. And what sufficiently rich dynamics is something that we're talking about here. Okay. So this is a principle because it involves uh, things that we don't know for sure. Right? And uh, if you're referring to physical systems, it actually involves things that we can only ascertain in the laboratory. So I thought you're saying something about nature, not just about the knowledge that you have in nature, which is quantum mechanics, like this theory that we have. And it's interesting to, to look at, for different, at different models of, of computation, because looking at, at different problems in different models, sometimes the problem seems impossible to do in a practical way, in one model, and it's very simple to do in a different model. Right. Sometimes you can compare the two different models and see how one resource in one model is converted to a different resource in a different model. Right. So there are conceptual reasons for looking at these models to get insights into quantum mechanics. And of course, there are practical reasons as well, because if you look at different ways that you can harness quantum mechanics to do computation for you, Sometimes you can say, look, my model involves creating this array of you know, liquid helium and then playing with the bubbles inside. This is more or less a competition model actually is like that. Okay? Bubbles and liquid helium. And then you get some experimentalists and they say it's impossible to do this. You know, it's three Kelvin temperature and uh, one Kelvin, I don't know. And uh, it's impossible to do these things, right? And then you come up with a model that says something which is much closer to what you do in an experiment. Uh, so, looking at different models, they may actually be a very important way of bringing quantum computers into reality. Because if you can come up with requirements for a model, which are close to what you can do in life. Okay? So, there are conceptual and experimental reasons for looking at different models. So, these are some models which have been proposed for quantum computation. The second model, measure based on computation, Computation within linear objects that we'll see is very close to measure based on computation. A thematic quantum computation, which involves uh, evolving a system by changing the, the interaction between the subsystems slowly so that you, you start with the ground state of, of easy to construct Hamiltonian and move into the ground state of Hamiltonian, which invokes the solution to a problem. Right. And topological quantum computation, which involves uh, creating quasi uh, uh, particles and uh, manipulating the properties, like gradient, them, for example, in order to do quantum computation with them. So you would use like excitations of a two-dimensional uh, electric system, like you can, you can get some kind of semantic systems. Right? So I, I won't have time to go about, talk about all of these things. I don't even know that much about topological quantum computation, for example. But I will have time to talk quite a bit about the second model measure based on computation. Okay? So let's start with the quantum signal model. You see, it's very nice to get some of the simple quantum circuits that you can have. So, what is a quantum circuit? Each wire represents a <coughs> unit. Uh, these little blocks represent, represent dynamics right, that you can impose on the units. And there are discrete dynamics. You see the separate boxes. So, each box represents some transformation you can do. You 
it's a unit there, it's a summation, you know, from the axioms of quantum mechanics. And that's it. I mean, I just have two, two examples of simple circuits. Uh, and, and we'll go through some of the, the what the symbols mean, right? And how you build what, some of them out of the others, some dynamics out of the other, right? So a qubit, as we've seen, and I think everybody, all of you probably have seen this, right? unless you just move to the qubit, you're completely crazy about uh, what are we doing here, party? <laughs> this, is a, this is a qubit, okay? So it's a convenient uh, parameterization of a qubit. Uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between points on the surface of this ball, of this uh, sphere, and a uh, uh, physically different quantum space for a two-level system. So as we do with classic computers, we call this two-level zero and one. And uh, here I have a complete, completely general physical state. You see that this happens to this real, right? But I made it real on purpose uh, by using the global, global phase that I can choose, right? Uh, without changing the physical uh, system that I have. <coughs> and what do I do with this uh, single qubits? I can do many gates, right? Each of these gates is a discrete transformation. It's a unitary. Right? Because it rises out of some Hamiltonian that you have if, uh, in your laboratory that you make this two-level system undergo. So we're all familiar with, for, for example, getting a spin and putting a spin in a magnetic field, at right? a constant magnetic field. There will be dynamics that the spin will be sucking around this uh, direction. Right? One of these gates can be, for example, the precession by a certain amount of time, which makes it go around halfway. Half a circle. Okay? So this is one gate. It's an example of a gate for a magnetic system. For course, the beauty of this is that you can represent the dynamics for any kind of system. They can be superconductors, they can be electrons in a solid, they can be whatever you like. Uh, and uh, by abstracting out these details, you can work out uh, the theory and find out new things in a much easier way. And also talk, I mean, it's easier to talk to different, between different uh, uh, experimentalists or different people working with different quantum systems using this language in common. So here there are some of the gates that uh, will be appearing a lot. Pauli, X, Y, Z. The Hartmann gate that appeared already first, uh, in Phil's talk. This is the phase gate. You see there's one and I in the diagonal. That's the second gate that I told you about, right? It rotates half around, uh, half a circle around the Z axis of this sphere. Okay? And then you have the Pi over eight gate, which rotates by uh, pi over four a instead of half. The circle is just one of the side. These are examples of uh, uh, more general gates, which are phase shift gates, which are gates which correspond to rotating the space of the sphere around the z axis. Of course, I'm talking about rotation because, of course, you're taking this state into some other state by a unitary transformation. For the unitary transformations on this two-level system, they map into <coughs> rotations in three dimensions. So I'm talking rotations because they are unitaries. Right? There's a theory, you can, it's easy to show that uh, any unitary in one qubit is a phase times a rotation operator. And uh, using this parameterization here, you see we, what, what this thing does is to actually rotate this, this state around some axis by some angle. That's why I'm calling the rotation of the time, because they are rotations in this case here. Okay? So if you go back, sorry. All of these are rotations, right? X rotation is a rotation around the X base, of course. Y and Z. And they are rotations by pi around each of these three axes in the blocks here. Okay? The Hadamard is very interesting because we know it takes 0 to 0 plus 1. So it, it, it brings the state from here to here eigenstate of x, okay? And it takes one to the other state there, okay? If you have a look at what, there are many rotations that can do that, but uh, the Hadamard is a rotation. It's a rotation around, uh, if this is that, this is x, it's a rotation of, by this axis, by pi, okay? So this is what it does, okay? This is what Hadamard does. Okay, you can choose any x and any angle, right, to do uh, this transformation. What about two qubit gates? If you have a look at these examples here, we also have these little wires that extend to two wires. I mean, these little boxes or symbols that extend to two wires, two different wires of the two different qubits. 
So these are two fluid gates that you feel right in the socks and you're probably familiar with them. This is a synapse gate, flips this bit qubit, uh, only if this qubit is one. This controls that gate that we've seen how to connect this in photonics, right? Uh, just said it's big. Uh, it introduces a phase here. So I won't say this guy, this guy introduces a phase in this guy if it's one, because this is a symmetric gate, actually, right? You can say that, you can say the inverse, you can say they both fire the line something. It doesn't matter, right? It's, an, uh, it's just a link. And this is a controlled unitary. Uh, if this guy is in one, then it controls the application of this unitary back here. It's just a generalization of these two controls. This controls that, controls that. Okay? So, um, I've been talking about the dynamics all the time, but we have to talk about what comes in. What's, what am I, am I going to act on? And what is going to be the measurement at the end? Because I have to extract information. Quantum computation in the circuit model involves doing transformations to these states that you start with and extracting information at the end. Otherwise, you may be doing very interesting computation and never learn about it. Right? So, the usual thing is to you have to choose a basis to start with and a basis for the measurements. And the usual thing is that this basis is the computational basis, which is the basis of the exact operator, which is 0 and 1. Zero and one are in the states of Z, with I get that plus or minus one, respectively. So this is what you choose for the initial uh, states that you have, because they will be typically they will be encoding some class of problem we want to solve, right? So it's not a you don't need a superposition. Actually, you're going to prove that uh, the binary description of the number one factor, for example, it's a class of information. And class of information can be encoded in, in a particular basis. So we're choosing one basis to do that. It's the basis for the Z magnetics, the Z operators. Okay. And this notation here is kind of weird. Uh, you see these two wires here. When you have these two wires, well, this represents a measurement in the Z basis. When you have these two wires here, it means apply this unitary only if this measurement is, gives result one. Okay. Corresponding to this state here. Okay. So it's a classical control. So this is a little bit different from what we've seen because I always put prepare measure at the end. Now I'm saying sometimes in the middle of the computation you're going to do a measurement and do something depending on the outcome. This is called adaptive synthesis because you may change your behavior depending on what you get from some intermediate measure. Okay? So this is important for what we will see later. So why do we measure? We have to choose some basis here. So choose the computational basis. Why do we measure here in the computational basis, right? What if I allow, right, in my model, for you to measure anything you want here? Not just the computational basis, but say a bell basis or maybe a more complicated basis involving global states of all the kids, right? Why, why can't I do that? Do you know? Why shouldn't I? Shouldn't in the sense of you shouldn't cheat. No? That's why you shouldn't. Because if you do that, I mean, if you can measure any global basis here, right, that means measuring, you're saying that you have the capability of measuring any observable you want from the set of observables acting on n qubits. Okay? The problem with that is that doing a measurement, if you, if you do a measurement which is still a product, I mean, the states are measuring are products, product states, right? This, this qubit under, 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 has undergone a unitary, there's not another one, there's not another one. This is fine, right? Because you can also incorporate these unitaries here in the big unitary here. And you only need one little unitary per qubit to measure any one qubit basis. So that's fine. That's not cheating, okay? You just incorporate it in the big view there, and it's fine. But if you want to do some global measurement, like this red thing there, then it's cheating because doing a global measurement, measuring in a basis, is always equivalent to doing some unitary and measuring in a fixed basis, which is a computational basis, for example. So if you allow yourself to measure in any basis you want, it's equivalent to allowing yourself doing any unitary and measuring the computational basis. Okay? So basically, what I'm saying is, 
a larger set of many qubits is very complex. A basis of many, of many qubits is a very complex option. In order to, to do the full thing of measuring the global base, you have to do, in general, you have to do this big fat U, right? Which can be exponential size. It can involve a number of gates, which scales exponentially with the number of input input have. Okay? So this is cheating, right? I've seen more than once, okay, people who claim to have solved many people with problems using a quantum computer. Okay? And uh, and when you go through the proof, one of them or the main mistakes that people do, one of the one of the big mistakes is say, and then see my circuit is quite simple, it has just n squared gates, say. And then just measuring the spaces, and you're done. Okay? Uh, this is cheating. Okay? You actually have to work out what the integers are in order to transform that into a measurement with z basis. And if all of that is small size, great, you win the lower class. Okay? Uh, or you the bump by someone else. Okay? <laughs> but uh, that's it. So, since there's a problem with choosing any basis you want, for the moment we're going to talk about uh, the second model, which is usual, starting the computational basis, measuring the, the computational basis. Okay? So, uh, I've shown you, I've shown you a few, a few gates, right? But you may need to do uh, different gates other than those that I've shown you. So, for example, in that description of this circuit, which is the three qubit quantum Fourier transform, this is what's needed for uh, the, the Shores quantum factor algorithm. You use quantum Fourier to swap. And if you have a look at the, at, at the picture, you see, oh, there's a controlled <coughs> rotation around the red basis by this angle. How do I deal with this thing out of that limited set of gates that I know how to do? Okay? Um, so, how do you do that? So, the problem now is suppose you only have a few gates that you can do. You can do it in any qubit you want, by any pairs of qubits. But you only know how to do that. Okay? How do you go about doing other stuff using just that limited set that you have? So the problem, if you can turn on the light here. The idea, the intuition about it is very simple. So it's similar to the problem of you can only do a rotation by, say, this angle here. Okay? But you would like to do a rotation by this angle. Okay? So this is equivalent to that I'm saying. I would like to move this dial from here to here. But I can only move it, I only know how to move the dial by steps of theta. Okay? So how do you do this? Uh, first, you might not be able to do it exactly. But nothing is exact in our lives. If you go to your world, nothing is exact. Okay? So what you actually want to do is to do something like I want to, to achieve my target here within some accuracy, say delta. If I, I land here somewhere close to my target, I'm fine. That's what I want to do. Okay? So what you do? Well, I've only been given one gate. Okay? I can only use it and then use it again and then use it again and hope to get there. Right? So do you get there? <coughs> if this data here is uh, what you need, what do you need? What do you need? You know? I guess? Irrational. Irrational. You have to have theta, which is an irrational uh, divisor of 2 pi, which means theta pi over 4, for example, won't work. Right? And why is that? Because you will apply theta many times until you get close to this region here. And this will inevitably help happen if this theta is an irrational multiple of 2 pi. If theta is a rational divisor of 2 pi, for example, pi over 4, of course, only like here, 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 and keep repeating. But if it's irrational, you fill the whole, the whole circle, right? So what you need is actually to, to, to densely fill the circle. And any irrational multiple of 2 pi will do that for you. Okay? And it's very easy to, to prove that. Okay? Uh, but I won't do that. But, uh, it's very easy. Basically, you just rotate many times until you find two of these applications which land very close together, so within uh, delta. Say, you do it k times, and then you do j times, and you find that the two are close together. And you can prove that that has to happen after about n steps, where n is 2 pi divided by delta. Right? And once you get there, you know, you know one rotation.
in another location that you can't do, which just spreads that little bit. Then you do enough of them, and you have to land here, because this is the size that you've shown you can do smaller than that. Right? So that's a good thing. But for it to work, I mean, this location has to be in the right shape of the part. So what does it have to do? What does this have to do with uh, like what's the problem here? Approximating unit pairs, for example, to create that uh, that unit pair. There have been any proofs saying, okay, have a look. This limited set of things <coughs> can be used to approximate any unit pair you want to any any accuracy that you, you you might want, right? And this is a, a set of cases that does that. If you see, this is the hardware case we've seen. These two are phase case, the, the one that put phase by pi, by pi by four, and this is the synod case. So with this set of gates, the sweet set of gates, applying the name, single unit, single qubit or two qubits you want, you can approximate any set of unit pairs, right? And what are, what are the steps of the proof? There are many different proofs, right? But basically the idea that you what you want is, is basically what I was trying to do here. You need to prove that concatenation of the set of, sets of gates only from the set fills densely some sort of space of the space you want to reach. But not all of it, because these two qubit gates, actually, uh, the synod gates, help bring what you're doing in some sort of space to all the other subspaces of the system, other two dimensional subspaces of the system. So the proof is basically showing first that if we can do any single qubit gate, then with synods, you can do exactly any unitary you want. Okay? And this is a problem in linear algebra basically looking at how you bring some sort of space of the space you want into all the space by applying the two-qubit operators in any two-dimensional subspace you have, like four-dimensional space. Uh, so I won't, I won't prove that. <coughs> I, mean, I put the other references in the, the web page there. And the second part, any single qubit unit that can be arbitrarily approximated using two gates only, which is H and T. Um, if you, if you see here, I, I put the third gate, but this is because many people use this gate because there are uh, fault tolerant constructions which use, have to use this gate. So if you want to do a computational real system and have to use error correction fault tolerant techniques, then uh, uh, it's convenient to have this gate. But actually, the proof works for just HT and C now. Okay. So how do you go about proving that? It's similar to what I was doing there with the paper in the circle. Okay. I only have T and H. So what I have to do, what I have to do, is some sequence of T and H's, okay? So if you, if, you, if, you, if you remember the T gate, it's a rotation around Z by pi over four, okay? So this is a possible thing you can do. Uh, if I do H, T, H, then this is an X rotation of pi over four. So you have a rotation around Z and around X. But that's not good because it's a fixed angle rotation, right? If you had any rotation Z and any rotation in X, then it could decompose any unit. But so far we don't have that. But if you do this other sequence, which is T, I mean, sorry, this rotation followed by this rotation. This is rotation by a different angle. I mean, this can work out easy. Uh, I mean, around the different axis, which is given by this field, by, by, by this unitary, by this, uh, this uh, vector there. Okay, this is the axis of rotation. And you can show, you can prove that uh, this angle of rotation is irrational of two pi. So this means doing many rotations of this, each rotation of this, this four instruction operator, right? You can do uh, irrational multiples of two pi. So this means there is this axis there, n, and you can you can get anywhere you want around this axis. Right? You can do those rotations. So that's good, but it's not a, not exactly what we need here. And the next thing you have to do is. So, well, if you apply H, this rotation is obtained, and another H, this is a rotation around a different axis. So now I have N axis and N axis. They're not orthogonal. Okay? If they were orthogonal, then you could just apply Euler's theorem. Right? We know how to decompose around two. If you have two orthogonal uh, axes, you can decompose any, any rotation in terms of rotations around those two. Here, here, and here. Just here. But there's a theorem which is similar. If, even if the two axes are not total, you can still decompose any unitary in a finite number of rotations around the two. And this number doesn't depend on the unitary, it just depends on the angle between the two axes you have. 
So this is what, that's, that's, that's the missing part that we have to approximate any unitary you want. Okay? So you can approximate any unitary you want, but you see, I'm, I'm saying approximating in a very mathematical sense, right? I didn't say anything about, but this will cost you the lifetime of the universe, right? This could be the case, right? So how efficiently? Just saying, oh, this density fills doesn't say if you need a billion gates to do that, or that would be bad, right? So you have to talk a little bit about how hard it is to do this approximation, right? And fortunately, it's much faster than this approximation I told you about of rotations around one fixed axis. Okay? So I mentioned if you do about if you have if you want to accuracy delta, okay, you can get you need n gates, which is one of the delta, two pi over delta gates. On the other or two pi over delta gates to approximate anything that you need to accuracy delta. Right? So it's linear in the inverse of the error of the accuracy you want. Okay? But uh, the Solovey Kita F theorem tells you that you can do exponentially better than that. Okay? It tells you that you can approximate uh, to an error epsilon using log uh, 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 power of the log of one over epsilon. Okay? So it's exponentially better than if we were doing it uh, linearly. Right? Why can you do that? I mean, it's a bit mysterious to me, at least. Okay. But one thing that's needed is here, all the rotations, all the gates that you have to commute. Okay? You need non-commutativity of the gates. And this gives you these uh, shortcuts to get their exponentially faster where you want to go. Right? You can the unitary one you want. Exponentially faster than the naive uh, intuitive idea of how it would be able to. Okay? And the nice thing, the nice thing about this theorem, when you look at the theorem, usually it proves something like that. It says it can be done, right? And it doesn't tell you how. Okay? Many times you have proofs which are not constructed. But this theorem is actually constructed. And there's a nice uh, paper that I linked in the, the website uh, explaining what the algorithm is to, to do that. Uh, so, and it's an efficient algorithm, right? About the same number of computational steps as the number of cases of computing, the number of sequences. So, so that's very good news, okay? So this means that uh, if somebody draws a circuit which has some <coughs> polynomial size of gates, polynomial the number of qubits that you have, and it has very weird gates, okay? Because the guy thinks weirdly, and he came up with this algorithm, it has a weird gates, one or two qubit gates. Then it can translate to your favorite set of gates, provided your favorite set of gates is universal, like this set is. Okay? And the translation doesn't cost you much. So this gives you flexibility. It means you don't have to concern yourself so much about the experimental details, provided you can, you can do some minimal task, which is implement a universal set of gates. Approximate the universal, as you want to approximate these things. Do you have questions? You can interrupt me, okay? Go ahead. Ah, wait a minute, I just remembered something. In case you're shy, in case I talk, 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 and nobody mentions and says anything, even though they have this question, I didn't understand. What if the billion ball is quantum or something like that? Okay? I put a, a, a web form. You can submit questions to me. Okay? <laughs> if I find it fun enough or interesting enough, I'll comment on it next time. Okay? You can find it the same link that I mentioned. You can be funny and interesting enough. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Wait. You know, if someone has actually implemented in a friendly way. So the question is, if, if somebody has an uh, uh, easy to use implementation of some of the yes. I think actually this paper by Nielsen and Dawson uh, does that. They have uh, some software that accompanies it. There's a whole area which is about finding, uh, finding optimal sets of gates to approximate some things. Right? Sometimes we want to maximize use, minimize use of a particular type of gate, for example. And, and this, all, this whole area is called circuit synthesis, right, or population. Population, everybody's familiar, right? For classical computers, the people compile the quantum computers too. So, uh, yes, there are packages for doing that. Okay. And I think one of them is linked in this paper. So, here I, did, I, I, I told you, there are different sets of gates. I just 
show the set of the proof for, for that particular set, set of case, okay, which are diverse. But there are other known results, for example, almost any two qubit case is universal as well. When I say, what do I mean almost any? Okay? There's a uniform distribution of all the universe. There's a unique distribution which is uniform over the universe for all the universe. Right? And if you pick a gate from that uniform distribution, then almost certainly this gate will be, for two good gates, this gate will be universal by itself. Okay? So what I'm saying is similar to looking, looking at this problem here and saying pick a random rotation among uniformly among, among all rotations between 0 and 2 pi. <coughs> almost certainly be irrational. You know, because if irrationals are dense, right, in the set. So it's a, it's a similar thing, right? But just for a different group other than the rotation group, it's the unitary group, but it's the same flavor. So this can be shown, and was shown actually a long time ago. There's a different set of gates which I won't comment about. Uh, Richard Joseph proposed them and knows more about them than anybody in the world. So here we found the best person to talk about them, uh, called match gates and the swap gate. And the interesting, one of the interesting things about this, these match gates are, are a particular class of two gates. Okay? The interesting thing about this is that if you just have match gates, you can do sim simulate them on a class of computer. Any number of them, any qubits, not any qubits, any pair of qubits which are uh, neighbors, then you can simulate efficiently. But if you throw in swap gates, which you never think about as being quantum, Swap gates is just taking the two qubits and changing, exchanging them, right? Then this new set can do any computation, okay? It's universal computation. So this is a jump in computational power, which is huge, and uh, it's quite interesting. It's the kind of thing that you look at in this, uh, this kind of research. Another interesting set of gates, which are is universal, not to be universal, is the Toffley gate and Hadamard. So the top of the gate hasn't appeared yet. It's this gate here. If you have a look at this decomposition, it means there are three qubits. It's a three qubit gate. It means if and only if these two guys are one, they will flip the other guy. So it's a control control knot. Okay? These two guys control the third one. So that's what this uh, matrix is saying. Okay? And the uh, interesting thing about the top of the gate is that the top of the gate by itself is universal for reversible classical computation. So if you start with classical gate, uh, bits, you do reversible gates. So you can't do, for example, or and and, because that takes two bits and, take, uh, and the output is just one. So this is a reversible gate. You can't tell from the output what the input was. Okay? But you can do computation using reversible gates. And the interesting thing is, you only need uh, gates operating with three bits at a time. The equivalent result for quantum computation, as I've shown you, is that you only need two qubits, two qubit gates, and single qubit gates to do any computation. But to reverse the class computation, you actually need three bit gates. And you, you can do everything you want with just this single three bit gate, okay, the top one. So, what do you think is interesting about this set of gates? Does anybody want to say anything curious about them? My students don't count. They look like it wants to us. So, there are these two, well, there are these two different things which are interesting. Here. First one is that the Hadamard is taking something which is universal for classical computation to something which is universal for quantum computation, right? And uh, it doesn't need even, so, so this is a, another ingredient that brings you from classical to quantum power in computation, okay? So this is interesting in itself. And it doesn't need to be Hadamard. Actually, she, in this paper, he proved that any, uh, any unit that takes the, the computational basis to some basis which is not the computational basis <coughs> can do the same thing to get it off. Okay? So it doesn't need to be Hadamard that takes zero to an equal amplitude to the position of zero and one. Okay? It can be other gates. A little rotation. It doesn't have to be a big one. Right? So this is interesting because. It's one or another idea of what you need in order to go from classical computing to quantum computing. You need to go away from one fixed basis of computation. Basically, that's the idea. Right. Another thing which is interesting about this one. Anybody? Uh, are there any 
complex numbers in the matrix, but they have complex numbers in the Hadamard matrix. No, it's just one of the squares of two. The line is one of the squares of two. So these two gates, they don't have any complex sufficiency. Okay? This means that if you apply that on, the, on some computational basis, the, the computer will be real, the entities will be real all the time throughout the computation. Okay? So this is serious. Right? Uh, first, thing, first thing you could complain is, but didn't you say that you have to fill density with a set of all unitaries? Right? You're not doing it if you're just restricting yourself to, to the limit as they take real states to real states, right? True, okay? Uh, the answer to that is, there, is that there are different ways of doing computation. We don't need to fill this in the set of all unitaries to do more computation. What you need to do is to choose some encoding of, for example, two, cu two qubits. One logical qubit can, can comprise two qubits or three qubits or five qubits. And then be able to reach the dynamics on these large computers, not on the physical ones. Okay? So uh, it's possible to do quantum computation using only real bit, quantum bits, which are called, called rivets. Okay? Uh, and, and, uh, and, but in an encoded way, the encoded is more or less like this. You get your n qubits, you get one extra qubit. Adding a few qubits doesn't change. I mean, it's not possible at all. It's just a constant overhead, right? You add one qubit. And then you can show that there are gates which operate simultaneously, two qubit gates, on this register and this extra qubit. And one amplitude, the amplitude of the zero of this extra qubit, uh, stores the real part of the logical computation. And the other amplitude stores the complex part of the logical computation. So all qubits you use are two qubits. You're already using this register plus one. And this plus one, one extra qubit, brings you uh, uh, mirrors, exactly what you do in usual computation with complex uh, complex uh, Okay, So this is an encoding. Another example of an encoding I'm, sh I'm showing here. So th this, uh, this idea is called encoded universality. So it's a bit more general than what I was explaining to you until now. But it's typically what you have to do in a physical system. right? The system will not many times be clearly shown to you. This is a cube. You can do anything you want. Usually you have this is a, I don't know, class one, trans one, or other ones, okay? <laughs> and uh, I can only do this crazy dynamics on it, which is not universal at all. And many times what you have to do is to take two of these on, or three, and try to find a way to do any universal computation on the subset, it's encoded space, okay? So this is one example. Uh, this is the exchange interaction, which appears a lot of times in the condensed theory. Uh, you see that the same, you have spins, right, which couple, the ne ne nearest neighbor spins are coupled, and the coupling is the same for these three terms in the Hamiltonian, right, so this is called the exchange interaction. Usually you can have spin-spin interactions which have different couplings, of course, between the three, these three uh, terms. Uh, but in this paper, they show that using just a single interaction, you can do gates which are not universal, on their own, but if you use this encoding of three, three qubits per logical qubit, then you can do any encoded in the interval. So let the experimentalists tell you what they can do, and being a theorist, you have to work out uh, how you can help them, right? Many times by finding the, the appropriate encoding. Do you have any questions? Was that a soccer game? <laughs> <laughs> Signal? Like a goal for some team? You know, in Brazil, these things happen like a lot. It's like, I'll be in silence. I'll be in silence. Unless my team scores, then I want my, my mobile to ring and come. <laughs> OK. So uh, I won't be talking much about complexity theory here. But it's highly relevant to everybody who studies quantum uh, systems, of course. But I need to talk a little bit, right? Uh, so it can be shown that uh, generic unitaries, like random unitaries, if you pick a random unitary on n qubits, then you can show that uh, this unitary will likely require an exponential number of two qubit gates to approximate. Okay? You know, 
You understand what I mean? Somebody gives you a unit pair. He has to give you in some form, okay? If he gives you a unit pair written on a piece of paper on a hundred cubits, right? It's a two to the hundred by two to the hundred unit pair operator. This person won't be able to write it out, okay? But uh, uh, typical unit pairs uh, don't have many shortcuts. I mean, all the parameters are random. And you won't have any other way of, of, of actually writing it down. This means there's no encoding. There's no way of writing it in a simplified form, saying this unitary can be done in this circuit with only uh, 10,000 gates. Right? Because if so, you would have a, a compressed version of the big unitary that you want. Most unitaries are like that. Most unitaries, if you want, you want, you want to decompose them using the something like that theory and approximate them, okay? you will need an explanation of those. Okay? So this means, this kind of, if you haven't thought about it before, you may think, oh, I think everybody has been lying to me all this time, okay? Because they always talk about the index that they can do in the lab, and they can solve, you know, factory problems and everything. Have they been cheating? Uh, like, are they doing one of these index which we know we, we can't do? No, of course not, okay? That would be cheating. Uh, so, those index that actually solve problems, there are among a tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny fraction of all unitaries which can be expressed as a circuit with a polynomial, size, polynomial number of gates. Okay? So if you give a unit there by describing a polynomial number of gates, polynomial the number of qubits you have, this is a very specific, very compressed, very atypical unit there. <coughs> okay? So the, 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 the art of doing computation in the, in the in the quantum circuit model is finding such unit errors, right, which are highly atypical, which can be composed in small, small, in small, uh, small gates on small number of qubits in an efficient way. Okay, um, so the class of uh, the class of uh, the class of problems that you can solve using a reasonable size circuit of one or two qubits gates, say. Um, in polynomial time, because there is a polynomial number of operations you need to do here, it's called BQP. Okay? So this is this this uh, this is the class of problems that can be solved in a quantum computer, probabilistically, with high probability, say about above two thirds, uh, in a reasonable size set. So this is this encodes what's reasonable to be computed by a quantum computer. Okay? You want you don't want of course to allow for exponential number of gates for so this is a, this is quantum computing in a nutshell. Okay, uh, the definition. There are of course there are of course many other comp uh, computational classes. I don't know how much I want to delve into that, but at least these little ones, which are called the petting zoo, you know, these zoos that you go, there's a goal and a turtle, and you just you know acquaint yourself with them, you know, you don't see any lines or anything. This is a petting zoo of uh, computational complex classes. So here you, we have the the class of problems that solve for polynomial time, that is reasonable time, polynomial that on the size of the input, by fast computer, P. Okay? Then you have BPP, which is polynomial time and class of computer, probabilistic. Right? So uh, actually there are many algorithms which are, we have algorithms which work using random numbers and solve the problem with high probability, and you don't have uh, a polynomial version which is deterministic. There are some projections that any problem that you can do with randomness, you can de-randomize and find uh, a way to do deterministically. Like recently it was done for prime probability testing. I don't know if you heard. A few years ago, uh, until a few years ago, people couldn't decide if a number was prime deterministically. They couldn't decide if an algorithm that worked with any precision they wanted, it was efficient. But it, it had a small time probability of error. Okay? It was a probabilistic algorithm. But recently, uh, there was another algorithm found which is deterministic. So maybe these guys are the same, maybe not. But certainly, this is included in here. So these lines denote inclusion. So this is included in here. This is the class of just defined quantum computation. It includes classes which you can do with class of deterministic computers, probabilistic computers, because, of course, quantum mechanics does everything that a class of computer does. And it even has coins, right, for your split. You can just take units, take how one to measure. This is a random number. And these are the classes, of course. NP is a class of problems which can be checked, whose solutions can be checked in polynomial time. But they may be, uh, they may be hard to solve. The time, you may need an exponential amount of time to solve the problem. 
But once you've solved it, it's easy to check that you have a solution. So there's a symmetry between the problem solving and problem checking. Okay? Um, and, uh, and everybody knows, you must know, that if you solve, if you decide whether this guy properly includes this guy or not, if they're the same or not, then you win a million dollars right, by the Clay Mathematics Institute. It's one of the million dollar prize problems. I think it's still one, is it? I think so. I mean, I don't mean to imply that somebody has solved it. <laughs> I just need to imply if the institution is still running and, and, and they still promise to pay and everything, of course. This is, is, is very famous as one of the hardest problems in the history of mankind, depending on who you talk to. Okay. Uh, and then there are these other classes, PP, which is bigger than NP. It's like solving an NP complete problem that's the hardest problem than NP. Uh, for example, the traveling salesman problem, three, three set satisfiability and all. You've heard about this thing. And actually counting the number of solutions. So NP would be solving them, because once you solve them, you can check them easily that the solution has been found. But uh, if you have this computer that can do, can do PP problems, you can actually co count how many solutions. Which is usually harder than just deciding whether there is one or not. And there's P space, which is everything you, you, you can do if, <coughs> if time is no problem. Okay? Uh, if, you can, if you can do uh, in any amount of time on a finite, on a polynomial size in every space. Okay? So this is uh, quite high up in the complex class. Almost any problems enclosed here. The only, the only the only class that I know that which is higher than this is exponential, which is given exponential time, exponential memory, what can you do? Okay, which is even bigger than this space. Okay. So I won't talk much about that. <coughs> now what we'd like to do to change a little bit this uh, this universal circuit. Okay, so we've been talking up to now about what makes <coughs> what is a quantum computation of the circuit model. We've discussed we need to have apply a unitary, uh, not any unitary, but some unitary that can be decomposed in little bits, in little case. And you start with the computational base, it's a method of computational base, right? And this is find the class of problems that you read about in years and so on. Okay? But uh, let's start playing around with this model, changing things and seeing what happens. So the first thing we'll do is uh, to think about limiting the dynamics, okay? So you start by changing the gates that you can do. So in order to do that, I'll, I'll choose a particular set of gates, which is quite interesting and appears all everywhere in information theory, which is the, the Clifford group of unitaries, okay? So we start with the Pauli group. The Pauli group is the group that you obtain by multiplying those Pauli operators, canceling the, the Pauli operators, and multiplying by a phase which can be plus or minus one, plus or minus i. The space shouldn't bother you too much. It's just that, of course, when you multiply uh, z and x, you get i, y, right? And if you want to have room close the multiplication, you have to include that y in the set of group values. Right? So that's why the phases show up. So the power group, everybody who works with quantum information has done some operations on power operations, right? So the power group is a, power, uh, a set of all such operators built out of single pivot problems. The Clifford group uh, are unitaries that map all Pauli operators into some other Pauli operators. Okay? So this is the method. First, if you want to map has a way, uh, an operator, you have to sandwich it between U and U diagram, right? In this case, C and C diagram, C for Clifford. And to be Clifford means that you could do that to a Pauli, you have to obtain a Pauli. It may be a different Pauli, but it has to be Pauli. Right? So the Pauli is the centralizer of the Clifford group. But, so, since, since the sliver takes Pauli for Pauli, you can just multiply it by C on the right here, and you find this connection here, which is important, and actually appeared in the last call. Right? It says, a, cliff, uh, a Pauli followed by a Clifford operator. It's the same thing as applying the same Clifford operator followed by a different power, possibly different power. You see? So it's not a computation relation, because well, they don't use, but they almost do. When you change the order, what are the changes? <coughs> this is the properties of the Clifford group. And it will be important in manipulations in which you 
wants to change the order of operations. Okay? Clifford Group have a very nice way of dealing with that. That's their problem. So Clifford Savings, if you look at Clifford Savings, well, I, I described that in terms of a group, right? But you can show that it's generated by these operate operations. Which means if you start from the computational basis state, some computational basis state, and only apply to phase A, Z, other than I've seen not, all the cases we've seen already, you this is the the the, the this circuit involving only those gates is slippery. So what it does to power is to change power to some other powers. That's all it did. <coughs> but if you look at the set, the set is quite general. Okay? If you want to build a Bell state, you use only that set of operations. Okay? If you want to build a cluster state, a data state, a GZ, you only use these operations. Okay? So clip and tickets are general. They appear in error correction. They are highly entangled. Okay, there's a whole theory of entanglement restricted to that set of uh, states which are obtained from Clifford operations, which are called stabilizer states. Uh, states which are obtained by operating with some Clifford circuit on the computational basis state. Okay? And which is quite interesting and, and mirrors the structure, the entanglement structure of general states. So these states are quite nice. And the nicest thing about them is that despite being so rich, despite creating states which are highly entangled, do all types of entangled measures that you know about them. Uh, Clifford, Clifford gates are uh, efficiently simulable. That means, on a classical computer, you can keep track of what's happening and predict outcomes of measurements at the end here, or the Clifford circuit of any number of things. Okay? And I won't go through that in detail. I know that Richard will. Uh, I talked to him before. But I'll just give you an idea of one way of doing that. Okay? The main idea behind this kind of simulation algorithm. And the idea is, of course, computational basis state, by construction, they are either states of Z operators. Identity Z tends to minus Z, tends to Z, tends to minus Z, depending on whether you have 0 or 1. Okay? So the initial eigenstate is a stabilized state, because it's an eigenstate of a power operator. Okay? Now you look at your Clifford circuit here. It's made out of Clifford. Uh, each Clifford unit there maps the, the, the stabilized state into a different stabilized state, okay, which is an eigenstate of a different power. Right? Because we've seen that Clifford operate, operators, they take powers to powers. This means if this guy starts as an eigenstate of poly i, after a different gate, it will be an eigenstate of poly j. Okay? A different power. So in order to do this computation, you, what you won't do is write down the state of the system. Because this state is huge, exponentially large. If you write down the entities, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, you won't finish that. Okay? But if you use the highest computation, what you have the way you store the state is. Uh, in, the, in the initial state, it's like a state of z, z minus z, z minus z, z, z minus z, z, minus z. That gives you the initial state. Right? And then you update the state after each case. And this update can be done efficiently. This is the details of the algorithm, because the operator is not too, too large, the representation of the half uh, And then after gate, gate after gate of the clinical circuit, you do this update rule. So in the end, you will know which power uh, state the final state is an eigenstate of, and with which I can it. So you can tell what's going to happen if you measure it, because it's a power measurement as well, which is the end yeah, of Z. Okay? So this is the gist of the idea of how you can do simulation. Basically, you use the high <coughs> Instead of keeping track of the states, you keep track of the operators which have that, that state as an eigenstate. And because the, the group is slippery, it has high dimensionality, high number of elements, and an efficient description, and you can do this uh, simulation fast. Yeah, yeah. Quick. I have two questions. First one, when you say that Clifford group is generated by that set, do you think generated in the in the sense of infinitesimal transformation? There are no infinitesimal transformations. No, not at all. Okay. So yeah. So so generated in terms you, you can concatenate them in any order. But you don't concatenate different versions of them with different cutting coefficients. Actually, those gates, those matrices, it's a discrete set of matrices. So you can never get into the of that. 
It's not a container, it's not a liquid. Right. It's a distributor. Ah, okay. So, and what is P in that term? Uh, P is a rotation around Z by I, by pi. So, one I in the diagonal. It's one I in the diagonal. So, introduce this I in the one I say, and does nothing to say. All right. Okay? So, it's a rotation by pi around Z axis. Enriches thought, enriches lecture. It will say everything that's known about what you can do if you change the initial state here. And if you change, if you introduce adaptivity. And if you change the measurements that you can do. And if you want to do a stronger weight to the agency. So I'll talk one thing about that, but it'll be nice more. It's uh, in the other parts, okay? Any other questions? From non organizers for <laughs> Can you tell these students that for <laughs> here? <laughs> so, so, okay. So, if you look at the set, okay, uh, you might think, oh, isn't that exactly the set that we, we put as universal, right? Is that something missing? I don't remember exactly the, the set, right? There is something missing, and the, the, what's missing here is the T-gate. The T-gate is a rotation around Z by pi over 4 instead of being the S gate, which is a rotation by pi. You would think, you might think, that it wouldn't make much of a difference, right? But it does. The difference is huge. Because if you, as I've said already, if you only have these gates, you can simulate everything efficiently. And if you add this gate, then you have a universal set. So this is another example. One gate making the whole difference about the potential power of the ball. Okay? So, there is more than one way of giving this extra power to this slippery computer. Okay? The first way is actually well, giving him this extra gate. Okay? But a different way, which is the question you asked, uh, what if I change this input space? Right? And I won't change them in a I won't, I won't change them in a legal way, okay? Which is I'll allow for states which are uh, still separable states. But each qubit is not in zero one state anymore, it can be a superposition of zero one. So I'm not giving access to a complicated and tangled state that somebody built to help me out in the computation. I'm just, instead of starting with these two states, I'm not giving them another. Okay? I'll start with different states. But they're all single qubit. That's the problem of single qubit uh, states. Okay? And if I do that, this simple state, this is an idea due to a uh, graph in Kipad, okay, 2005. These states were called magic states. They're known as magic states. Okay? So there's magic in quantum computation. Okay? <laughs> officially, officially. There's lots of things. If, if, if you Google magic state distillation, you find lots of stuff, right? Many of you know about it. Uh, so this magic state, you see, you have the space e to the i pi over 4. And if you, if you go through what the circuit does is contour knots between the first and the bottom, measurement of the bottom, pivot, with the computational data. And then, depending on the result, you either apply S and X, actually X and then S, or you don't. Okay, so this is adaptability. And if you do that, if you can control and do this design theory only in, uh, when one of, the, one of the outputs happens, the output is up to a phase exactly T applied on the original figure. Okay? You can just work it out. You can just do the calculation yourself. Okay? So, why is this interesting? I'm relaxing the, the requirement, I mean, I'm relaxing the definition of the computer I'm talking about, but just a little bit. I, I have a clear computer. Now I have a clear computer with access to still several states, but they're not the computational basis anymore. Right? And I can do adaptivity. Right? So if you can do, ah, this picture was terrible. Sorry, I have to text. If you can do adaptivity, then you can do uh, a gate which you couldn't before, right? And this adaptivity only involved measurement of the Z basis, control knot, which is the clipper group, and a control unitary, which is in the clipper group too. So it's still only doing clipper operations. But somehow you're transferring that E to the I pi over 4 from the states to the computational states you have in every group. Right? So you're doing an E gate because you have an oscillator system, a magic state, right? 
have enabled, enabled you to do that. That's what's natural about it. Okay? And the picture that I put there that nobody can see is an octahedron connecting the x, y, and z uh, states, i states. So it's an octahedron. I, I don't have to use that. So what people say, I mean, you don't have to, you don't really need to have that state there. You can start with some state which is mixed, many copies of mixed states, which are just on the sides of the hidden. So they don't have to be pure. Provided they're not too close to the octahedron in some directions, there is a protocol that distills them into very pure magic states, only doing different operations and adaptive measures. And then you can compute the switch goal as a minimum of one. So this is called magic state distillation, distillation. So you can start with many. If you have a system that does fit with gaze naturally, and topological quantum computation gives you models that do that, okay? And you can provide this computer with these states, which may be trickier, then you have quantum reverse quantum computer in hands. Okay? So, so this is one motivation for doing it. Uh, Alexei Kita is actually told to compute uh, the, the importance of one's contribution to science by money. He got ten million dollars uh, prize, was it? I think so. Three million. Three. Okay, three. Not ten, but just three. <laughs> uh, for his contribution, right? On the large quantum computation and these ideas. So basically he's been studying how uh, how these uh, excitations in the dimensional system can be used to prevent some gates in a topological protective way that is again robust against errors. Right? And one of the goals is actually using ideas like that to supplement some limited kind of computer, which can be done with reasonable physics, in order to do universal computation. So that's one of the reasons people study this kind of thing. Okay. Now uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some restricted models of quantum computation. I started with about 15 to four, right? This is an idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, why am I restricting a quantum computer? Don't you want to have a good quantum computer? But why are you going to restrict it? You know? What's the idea? Right? The idea uh, of looking uh, at restricted quantum computers is because there are some regimes when quantum computers become simulable in a classic computer. And you want to identify those because you don't want to do and also because people are concerned about class and quantum <coughs> transition. And these computers, which are quantum, but which are so restricted that work like classical, right, give you a hint about what's necessary to go from classical to quantum. So it, it, it tells you about uh, what's, what's, uh, what the important bits of quantum mechanics are. Uh, so that's, it. that's one of the ideas for looking at, uh, at restricted uh, Another one is because you may restrict the quantum computer so much that it doesn't do universal quantum computation. But it might still be able to do something which is useful. Okay? And uh, why would you do that? Because many times you're restricting by cutting out operations which are hard to do in the laboratory. So you may restrict the computer in a good way. You're bringing it closer to what can be done in the laboratory. Okay? So if you do it and you lose quantum universality, but your computer can solve some problem that interests Google, okay, for example, then uh, people will, Google will, will invest in like, that computer, and actually, it has it. <laughs> you might have heard it. Uh, Google is investing a lot in quantum computation and adaptive quantum computing, <coughs> which is not reverse quantum computing, it's a specific type of adaptive quantum computer done by D-Way. So we have that, right? of course. So one, one another reason to study the pursuit of quantum, uh, quantum computers is because they may be easier to implement in the lab. Well, and this is the third point I'm saying uh, I'm using here, and this will relate to some things that we talked about the main the data. Okay. No reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought a lot. Oh, but <laughs> yeah, this supposed to scare you. I didn't put it here, see? But it's so filled that nobody saw. It. <laughs> so, so this is a picture I used to scare some some students in in Rome. I went to a lot of those, some of, some of you don't do that. But the idea is just to give an idea of some of the connections we were talking about in the next lectures. Okay? 
Uh, and some of, some of them I won't, but will appear in uh, other courses, especially in digital courses. So in the third lecture, I'll be talking about free bosons, like bosons that don't interact. The kind of bosons that do the Hongo Lundberg effect, there are photons going into this circuit. Okay? Um, <coughs> we'll see that there's a mapping between what these guys can do and what you can do imagine based on computation if you don't have the disease. Well, we'll see that based on computation next class. The next uh, there's a set of gates which we will talk a little bit about now, uh, which consists of commuting gates. That's another restriction that you can do on a computer to say, I want gates to commute. Uh, and these are all connected. Of course, if you relate to the restriction, you get quantum computation. Okay? If you don't have bosons, but you have uh, some kind of anions, easy anions, this is equivalent to the quick series. If you have fermions, then fermions are simulable efficiently, okay? And they are connected with the uh, mesh gates. And uh, mesh gates are a way to describe that dynamics of free fermions. So what you set well, if you have bosons and uh, introduce adaptivity, uh, which Philip talked about today, right? Then you have uh, the scheme for uh the KLM scheme for linear optical computation. So you can jump. So what I'm doing here with these three colors is drawing attention to you that there are many connections in many ways that you can start with a model which is non-universal and is restricted. This model may be useful for some things that we know, like this DQC1 that I'll be talking about, or not, or not so far, like was assembly. Uh, and you can get these restricted models. You can either restrict them even more, these models, by cutting out some of the some of the, the, the resources. And they will become simulable, efficiently simulable, classical, in a very strong sense, computationally classical. Or you can upgrade them in many different ways to obtain universal quantum computing. Right? So this is a, just a, you can ask questions about that if you want to, in that form. But do you have questions? Up to now. What do the geometrical constraints? Okay, yeah. So uh, match gates are typically gates which are simulable if you only act on nearest neighbors on a one-dimensional chain. But if you connect on further neighbors, like next nearest neighbors, with the same universe, then they're universal computation. So, so if you think about different models, I mean, who, has, who says that the qubits have to be like a circuit model in a one-dimensional chain, right? With one near, two nearest neighbors only. Many times you can build up to left, in which they have four neighbors, or you can do two-dimensional, depending on the system. So it's interesting to see what the geometric constraints of interaction between the qubits can change the computation power of the model. And in this case, it goes straight from uh, simulable dynamics to inverse computation. To do that. Another question? Yes? Is there a reason why three bosons do occupy such a central place? Yes, because I am the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I work on both uh, with, with three boards, and I'll be talking about three boards. Okay. And I actually put, put the slides together in a, in a photonic song. So, okay. But uh, these are reasons, I mean, which are not these reasons. I mean, all this understanding what you can do to upgrade the power of these guys here, or to bring them, make them more classical, is what motivates me most. Okay? But uh, you may be motivated by, by other things, like you may be doing both incentive because you want to be the one you know, to claim that you can have a computer that does something that a classical computer can do. Yeah. You, you may you want to demonstrate your quantum computation or experiment with it. This is big motivation. Uh, and both of is a very restricted model <coughs> which allows itself to do experimental implementations, some of which have been always so That's why it's simple. Okay. Any other questions? Crazy mm -hmm. lies are good. Let's see what I can do. Um, so, before I continue, uh, well, before I continue, before I finish, <laughs> uh, it, uh, what's the name of this? It's a Frightened Slip. Uh, I'd like to talk about two different ways of simulating, of, of, of two, two different notions of simulability. Okay? 
So when I said that the Clifford circuits were simulable, I was talking about strong simulation. A strong simulation is I can compute on a class of computer the probabilities of all the outcomes of things I'll measure. Okay? So I can compute. If I measure this thing, is it going to be 0 or 1? If you can't write a computer program which is efficient and can tell you with certainty, then this is a strong simulation. Okay? Uh, there is a, weak, a weaker notion of simulation, which is weak simulation, of course, uh, which is you take a quantum computer and you have a class of computer that's going to simulate. And then what your, what your class of computer is going to be asked to do is to say output events as if with the same probability distribution that the quantum computer will output them. Because you repeat the quantum computation many times. Sometimes most computations are probabilistic, right? So sometimes some outcomes will come out, sometimes some others. And what you're asking the class of computer is to sample from that same distribution or from an approximate version of that distribution. Okay? So this is weaker than actually finding each probability. Right? You just have to throw bits which are distributed in the same way that the quantum experiment will output them. Okay? Uh, but this is more reasonable too, because the quantum computer doesn't at the end say this group is going to be with probability 0.7251. That's not what the quantum computer gives you. What the quantum computer gives you is some distribution of the possible outcomes of the Z measurements at the end. So to ask the class of computers to compute these probabilities is to ask too much of the class of computer. Right? Uh, the, the, the fairer way of comparing them is asking the class of computer to do exactly what the computer does. Output from the same distribution than the class of computer. Okay? Or than the quantum computer. So in terms of these two simulation schemes, the Clifford simulation scheme I told you about is strongly simulable. Okay? Uh, because that, that has the picture I told you tells you exactly what I can say to have, hence tells you exactly what the outcomes are. Right? Roughly speaking. Uh, whereas if you just change, you take the same co computer, but you change the input to magic states, then it's not simulable, neither weakly or strongly, because it's universal for quantum computation. We believe quantum computers can do things probabilistically that quantum computers can't do. Right? And this Clear computers which became classical is doing exactly that kind of thing. It became universal, it's doing exactly that kind of thing. Okay? Uh, okay, I think I'll have to start this one here. Yeah, no, oh, yeah, I'll open for questions. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you that nobody even knows for sure, mathematically speaking, that there are math problems. Because right, we don't know if P equals to NP or not. So in complex theory, uh, all of complex theories build on hypotheses, and some of them are believed to be stronger or weaker, depending on what they're based on. Right? But uh, there's no proof that there exist math problems uh, in the sense of the civil problems. Right? That's the difference between P and but uh, for these information models, it's very, well, there are lots of benefits. I'm talking about it more next time, okay? That uh, they, they can't do universal computation. It's not just a lack of uh, imagination, okay? Uh, you can do I can say that the D algebra is not complete. You can, uh, you can do, there are many connections with many different problems which suggest that they're actually doing some part and suggest in them. It's almost certain that they're not, they're not doing the universal computation either. So is it in the same status as P is different from NP? Yes. Well, it's not exactly the same, okay? 
There's there's something called the polynomial hierarchy, which is a generalization of D and E. Uh, and that thing would fail in flux. So it's the, the next best thing, I would say. Something like that. Yes? Uh, what did you say? There's no hard problem. We don't know if there's a hard problem or not. No. Not even a very special example. No, no. no. There are the same problems which are hard. There are problems which are known for, for example, to be sharp D hard mm -hmm. or P D hard. Uh, I just don't know whether this classifies as a as a problem which is naturally natural. You know, uh -huh. they,